No, not yet. Hopefully this weekend. So only Aya is not here if I get to try it. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay, so... So let's continue with this thing we're doing. <clears throat> I hope by now you understood uh, or you're understanding uh, uh, what we're doing. Uh, we're trying or I'm trying, we're trying to figure out uh, these areas of experience, really you have to take it very simply, it's things that you live all the time, but most of the time we don't notice these things. So uh, the image types, which is the uh, main, uh, the central point in this course, the image types, are really like areas of lived experience. This is what an image type is. So you see, emotion or the emotive is a whole sphere of uh, existence, uh, which is dealt with, uh, as you have seen in the image affection. And we try to see, uh, you know, uh, when you are a kind of emotional person or you really are into affections, sensations, and stuff like that. Uh, what, uh, what, is, what is really your interest? And you've seen that your object is, you know, something which is not actual, something that you feel, as we say. And we've seen how you try, or these artists, thinkers, etc., try to uh, express this, these entities which are potentially here. Now, um, so, uh, so if you take each type is really like uh, one of these uh, experiential uh, spheres. You have perceptions, action, etc., uh, which are all part of then the big sphere, which is the image action. Now, now what's the difference or the main difference? between these two uh, big areas now, which are the image time and the uh, uh, movement image, time image, movement image. What you need to understand is that the movement image, or, or what you call modernity, or uh, cla the classical image, uh, on a kind of existential level, is when you are uh, in possession of your faculties, you know, you want to be a doctor, you study, you become a doctor. Uh, so you are in possession of your faculties, you take decision and you orient your life, and everything goes the way you uh, plan. Of course, the counterpart of this uh, classical image or the modernist image is the sensory motor organization. What does it mean? It means that you are well coordinated, uh, you do what you understand and you understand what you do, your affection, actions, and emotions are aligned, uh, meaning uh, if you have a goal, uh, you get angry, but just uh, in, the, uh, in a measured way. You get feelings, but in a measured way. And you have thoughts in a measured way. And all of these things are well proportioned together and they are orienting at realizing your thoughts and your goals and your aspirations. And you can do that in the five image types that you have seen. You could have thoughts or aspirations as to change the tradition. Fine. If you do that, you will be in the impulse image. You can have thoughts to understand matter and the world. You would be in the perception image. You can have aspirations to uh, to change the context and the laws governing a sphere, uh, be it politics or art or whatever. If you want to change the laws, you do the mental image. If you want to change the world, well, you do the action image, so on and so forth. Now, you see the classical image is like that, is that you're set, you have an orientation, you can realize your goals, and you do that in a well-coordinated, well-intentioned, uh, uh, well-organized way. Now, the issue, the issue that we have start uh, seeing with the time image is that beside 
your rational, coordinated organization. Besides that, you have another thing, which is the irrational. And the irrational is really manifested uh, uh, as powers. Now, why you have powers and not any more ideas? You see, in the classical world, you have an idea with a big I, meaning you think what is the nature of matter or what is the essence of the law, or you think what is the uh, functioning of the tradition. And when you have an idea and you grasp this idea and you master it, you're able to, you know, to realize your project, whatever your project is. On the other hand, when it comes to time and the time image, this is when you deal with powers and not anymore with ideas, because actually your orientations and your uh, 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 orientations and prospects, etc., they are uh, deviated by something which is not dependent on your will. I think this is here's the main point. You have to see that this universe, yes, you have rationality and it functions uh, well, but you have also something else, which are forces that comes from we don't know where, and which are going to disturb your rational and well-coordinated uh, uh, organization. And you have seen some of these forces so far, some of these powers. Uh, for example, when you have something like a world war or like a civil war, you have this situation of destruction. And uh, this is when things start to get liberated from their functions and from their rational organization. You see, when you have a city which is rationally organized, you wake up one morning, you have, uh, you know, Beirut blast or uh, atomic bomb or uh, I don't know, a bombardment or something like that. And all of a sudden, this city, which is supposed to be uh, well organized and rationally organized, it turns into a pure visual lunar, right? it's as if you're on the moon now, uh, scenery. And when you are into that, when you witness that, you start seeing things as pure optical things. For example, your building is not a building anymore because it's half destroyed. You see the, uh, you know, you see the uh, ceramics and the tiles uh, on the walls in a destroyed building. Uh, you have big chunks of concrete hanging in the air. You have steel which is getting out uh, in a kind of random shapes. You can't anymore use the building. This is the suspension of your sensory motor organization. You don't know where to walk, what to do. And when you're unable to know what, what to do or uh, interact with the thing, it appears to you as a pure visual entity. This opens on the pure optical and sonorous. So if you want one of the first step in the uh, getting out of the classical image, uh, it could be this violence where the world as we know it cracks and when the world as we know it as it is organized rationally cracks well this opens you on first the purely visual pure optics pure sounds are liberated from their assigned uh, functions uh, and this idea goes back to heidegger and you can find it before heidegger in, in bergson which is you know heidegger says as long as you are hammering using the hammer well, you forget the hammer and you forget yourself and everything is fluid and transparent. But if the hammer breaks in your hand, all of a sudden you take notice. You notice that, ah, oh, this is a hammer and it looks like that. And you start looking at it and this is when it appears to you. So if you want, it's a little bit into these ideas. Like when the world collapses, well, something appears, because as long as you're carried by your worries, your projects, your rational achievements, and you only see things as made for action, made for your project, you don't really see them. And you need this rupture. Some people take LSD or I don't know, uh, uh, hash or whatever they take in order to, to break this kind of uh, uh, urgency where they need to do things 
and where they are always taken into the uh, organized flow of the world. So when you take acid or when you have a war, what happens is that your sensory motor organization is disrupted. And this is when you start seeing. I think uh, uh, one of the main points in the time image is that this is when you start to see. The difference with the movement image is that in the movement image, you see but after you think. While in the time image, you have to see while you are thinking in the same time in order for you to be able to do something with these things that you are seeing now. Or else you fall into a pure seeing, uh, which is not pure at all, which is the cliche and all of these snapshots that you can have. So we have seen uh, last time, just to, to conclude on this kind of uh, revision, just to situate you, uh, we have seen so far two uh, types. The uh, order of time, which is when the order of the world collapses and you have a new order, which is the order of time that starts to emerge. And this is when you have these atoms of visuals and sounds which are scattered in your uh, environment. Now, these atoms of visuals and sounds this is when you can, you, you can connect them into a circuit. What I'm saying is very simple. Let's take the example that you have seen last time, which is the example of the, uh, uh, the guys that you cannot uh, recognize. Uh, I talked to you about that last time, meaning you are in the walking in the street, you encounter a person, and instead of recognizing him, which should be part of the classical way of remembering, you look at him and you don't know anymore who is this guy. Now, when you have this, obviously, you have a disruption in your normal sensory motor rational organization, and the guy starts to appear as, who the hell is that? Now, when something appears to you as, who the hell is that? We call this a pure optical thing or a problematic point. It's a problematic that is, that, point. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. can you invite Aya? Because she's not able to join. I don't know why. Okay. I in, invited her. Okay, Thank you. so uh, anytime. So I was saying that when you see some of that Hello, you don't know anything, uh, when you see someone that you're unable to know, this is what we call a problematic visual or point in this case. And this is when your memory goes into circuits. You go to look for the memory that is going to tell you who this person is. And this circuit, you do it by schematizing. You look at a piece of his face, at his nose, uh, at his lips, and by schematizing, you go and you fetch a memory and you come back. So this is a circuit. This is the middle circuit that you have seen. And each time you go into this kind of round trip in your memory, you bring a memory and you see how the visual changes. So you have these transformations happening in front of your eyes until you know who this guy is, and this is when you go back to the normal, classical, well-organized world. But you have other circuits. For example, Bergson says when you sleep, or when you take LSD, or whatever, hash, etc., or when you drink too much, you know, when you are not in your normal, rational state, Bergson says whatever you look at becomes a trigger for a big circuit which is what you call the oneric or the dream circuit. Now, the dream circuit, you really go and you fetch memories from all over the place, meaning from your, the totality of your existence. And this is what you have called last time the dream image. Now, what is a dream image? And I, I insist on these things. You know, it's not that it's surrealist or it's weird or it's cool or, you know, these things that we uh, usually read uh, all over the place. A uh, dream image is defined in this course, at least, in a very, very uh, specific way. It is a relation between images where you have an anamorphosis. This is a dream image, and it's only that. Uh, what is an anamorphosis? Just to refresh your memories. 
An animal fossil is when an image morphs into another image provided a common schema. We have seen last time the cloud crossing on the moon. So you have circle and line. This is a schema. And the, in Buñuel movies, Le Chien Andalou, you have an eye and then a knife. So you have the same circle and line, and this is how you're able to pass from one image to the other via the common uh, schematization. This is what you call an anamorphosis, and actually dreams are like that. You have an image, and given some schema, you move into another image, and so on and so forth. And we have seen that dancing is one of these ways to put things in circles, meaning dancing is actually when you dream uh, why do you dream? Because the dust, all of these little variations that you have, let's say, in a city, you have a sidewalk and you have a chair and you have a bench and you have rain and you have uh, uh, the vitrine of a shop and you have people passing by. All of these things are not anymore considered as what they are. They are not anymore taken into these police. You know, police is another name for organized city. Uh, why? Because when you are in love, like in singing in the rain, uh, this is a, a shock, a problematic point, and it liberates a new uh, way of moving, which is not anymore policed, and it turns into a dance. This is when you start dancing on, you know, on the sidewalk as if it's, uh, as if it's a rope, and you jump, and you use your umbrella as if it's a baseball bat, etc., etc. And this is when you are really connected with these virtualities, and you open the circle, which is the circle of dancing that connects you to these uh, virtualities. And this is the biggest circle that you have seen uh, last time. Uh, the last one is the smallest circle, which is the crystal. You see, uh, middle circle, you have some problematic points, some visuals, and you go fetch a memory to know what these things are like in Carnet and in uh, Mankiewicz. Big circle, where you have problematic points and you go, you know, all over the place, like in Minelli uh, dance movies or uh, the movies by, uh, some of the movies by uh, Buñuel, at least Le Chien Andalou. Uh, you, you have a, a smallest circle where you are just caught between you and yourself, between the present and its own past. The present and its own past is really the smallest circle, uh, the smallest circle of all, because as we've said last time, you, when you are sitting right here, right now, uh, you have in the same time your memory being activated. Because you have seen last time that, you have seen last time that uh, your memory can only rise while you are in the present. Uh, you see, the memory, uh, suppose you remember what you did yesterday, but the memory of yesterday was, was constituting during the yesterday. And you have seen that with the example of the four knocks. Now, the issue is here. So this is, as you can see, the, the, the smallest circle. And the issue is that while you are in the present, you have your double, which is your other self, and this is your little smallest circle, and you can stick to that circle. Uh, this is what Fellini, Visconti, or Ophuls do, uh, and even Renoir, which is how to picture someone, let's say, who is stuck in his own double image, like when you are stuck in your role, or when you are stuck with your wife, or when you are stuck uh, as a son. So all of these are roles which double you, and you can be stuck in the crystal. We have seen last time Visconti, where the musician in uh, Death in Venice, he is a musician and he's stuck into this formalist way of doing music. And when he is completely rotting and sick in Venice, he realizes that he was stuck all his life in this role of the intellectual musician. And because of that, he was not able anymore to reach the world. And he realizes that while he's dying by looking at the young man in the sea. 
So I'm telling you that these things that we are covering are powers. Why are they powers? Because indeed, if you go dancing, well, you could be really like taken by the dance. Meaning the, the chain reaction of the oneric, oneric, the dreamlike chain, you cannot control it. And actually to dance well and to be uh, happy when you dance, well, you have to be carried away. If you're not carried away, you're not a good dancer. You stay here, as you say, you know. I think you all went through this very painful moment where they invite you to dance and you don't feel like dancing and they start pushing you and pulling you. I tell them, no, I don't want to dance. And it's very painful and annoying because, you know, you, you, it's not only that you're stuck, you also feel on top of it that you are unable to, you know, get into this kind of letting yourself go. Yes, Noor, what's your question? Yeah. Noor, you raised your hand. Yes, uh, sorry, I forgot my, I was on. Okay, with regards to the concept of anamorphosis as the sequence of uh, uh, this transformative distorted sequence of images, can you consider Escher's work as an anamorphosis? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, yeah. Uh, I already told you that uh, Escher uses um, uh, anamorphic relations in perception. Uh, so I don't know if I mentioned that last time. I think I did. Uh, Escher's use of the dream image is very interesting. Why? Because he's able to make an image shift on itself, like it's up or down. Uh, it's a triangle which is... Uh, seen like this or like that. So this is the activation of uh, attentive memory, uh, which is not per se an anamorphosis, but sometimes he has some pictures uh, where he uses anamorphosis. So you have to be careful to distinguish these two. So I repeat, you see Escher, uh, most of the time he uses attentive memory. And I think, in very few cases, I'm not able to remember which ones now, he uses literally an anamorphosis. Uh, so if you take Escher's uh, stairs going up and down, this is not really an anamorphosis, it's more uh, attentive memory. Because if you schematize in that direction, you see it down. If you schematize in that direction, you see it up. So you are not really seeing an anamorphosis yet. On the other hand, if you take someone like Dali, Dali sometimes makes an anamorphosis in some of his paintings where you have a face, but the face is made of uh, bodies. I don't know if you remember these paintings. Uh, and this is when yes. you have, yeah, this is when you have an anamorphosis because actually the figure itself changes into another figure given these uh, 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 elements. So yes, it's delicate, but it's so good. All that, that comply, yeah, that they, all that comply pictures where we can see, like they like guess how many people you can see or things like this. They're all anamorphosis, right? Uh, no, this is the whole issue. Uh, for example, a trompe like the Chapel 16 is not an anamorphosis. Uh, where you look at these, uh, you know, Renaissance trompe oeil where you think that it's 3D, but it's not 3D, this is not an anamorphosis. So an anamorphosis, I repeat, is something very, very precise. It's when the schema takes you from one image into the other. And you see this transformation of an image into another image. Uh, you see it in front of your eyes, and it depends either on your movement or on the way you schematize. Now, if you schematize and the image doesn't change into something else, we don't call that an anamorphosis. It could be either an actualization of another memory like Escher, or it could be a trompe where you simply think that there's depth, but there's no depth. And in very, in other cases, it is really an anamorphosis because the image goes from, let's say, a curtain with white dots into a field with a green field with white lilies. Are you getting these three differences? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you have to be careful. Uh, and 
be able to distinguish in here, for example, three types of images, uh, uh, three uh, type of images, and not only uh, uh, one. Uh, so how do I go back now? Um, okay. So I hope this is uh, more or less clear. Huh? Uh, so you have home play, animal forces, actualization of memory, which are not all the same. And I was saying for the animal forces, you have this kind of power that takes you. But for the crystal too, you have a power that blocks you. And for the remembering, for the, the souvenir, the recollection image, you also have powers that force you to remember. So this is why in the time image, we talk about these powers because they take over your freedom or what you would like to do. There's something stronger than you that makes you go into these directions. Now, now uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a diagram, which is the Bergsonian uh, mod mod modelization of time. It's actually a very simple diagram. Uh, so where is it? Uh, it's not here. Ah, okay. So, okay, I hope you're seeing now the screen. This is what we call the cone that works on. Uh, I hope you're seeing it. Now, in the cone diagram of Bergson, as you see, you have the point S. The point S is where the crystal of time is, where you and your double are one in relation to the other. And this is what we call the cone of memory. So, and the plane P is the scattered world of uh, sensations. So you see, you, you are here, you are in S, and now at this moment, there's you and your memory being uh, coupled together and spinning on one another. This is what you call the crystal of time. And usually you go into circuits by going to A second, B second, A prime, B prime, A, B. This is when you go and you fetch memories in these circuits here, when you go up and down. Now, this is a way to go. And this is what we have seen so far, the circuits of time and the scattered uh, sensations on the plane P, which is the optical sonorous problematic sensations. And when the cone is moving on this plane, it starts collecting these sensations and you go into circuit if you are into the circuit type of image. Now you have something else which you call memory. And memory is different from recollection. Uh, recollection is souvenir, memory is memoir. And memoir or memory, properly speaking, is not only the circuit. Uh, in a circuit, you can go to a plane of memory and come back. But memory as such, as Bergson think uh, it's model, memory as such is actually is actually uh, uh, a cone. So it's a cone of memory, and uh, this cone, as you can see, is made of these uh, planes. And what you need to understand is that memory is this kind of totality where you have all your memories together. But the difficult point to grasp, which is not that difficult, is what is really going on in each of these planes. You see, some people think that, okay, the plane is, is just a plane. Well, no, it's not that. But I'll give you an example of a plane. For example, you have a plane of memory is when you were in high school. And when you are in high school, you have important people for you, I mean, like your friend, your best friend, your girlfriend, uh, I don't know, your basketball uh, coach, the professor of mathematics. These could be the important people for you. Uh, so they are really like the characters of this plane. And then you have shiny points. 
which could be characters or which could be events like the day where you uh, uh, you had your first beer. This could be a luminous point or the day when you won uh, uh, the race, uh, uh, the bicycle race uh, at school. This is another luminous point. The day where you failed your exam, another luminous point. So when you go in a plane of memory, uh, you have, of course, these characters and you have these luminous points. And when you remember, you go, you go there and you go and you inhabit this plane of memories. Now, you can go to another plane of memory, let's say when you were uh, six years old. Or you can go to a more recent plane of memory, let's say uh, uh, three months ago uh, and stuff like that. So these are planes of memories. And uh, the delicate point to understand is that these different planes are not static or rigid, like, you know, high school, and then you jump into another plane and so on and so forth. It's not like that. Actually, these planes are contractions of memory, meaning each plane, for it to be a plane, you need to contract your memory on it and to leave everything out. So when you contract your memory on a plane, where well, you're able to isolate this plane. But of course, your memory could contract in, shot in such a way where you have two planes together, two objective planes together. I explain. So the, uh, there's no need to, to, for you to get lost here. It's very simple. You have the objective time. Which means when I was in high school, it's not like when I was in university, and it's definitely not like when I was six years old. These are objective sections of time, and this is not what Bergson is speaking about in the cone of memory, because your, your section of memory doesn't always fit the objective time. Now, what does it mean? It means that for you, you know, when you remember your friend from university, he also reminds you of your friend at school. So here you see that the contractions of memory are not, you know, like uh, clean cut, but each plane contracts a number of memories together, and this is when you constitute a plane of uh, memory. Fine. Now, for example, if you take the present moment, what is it? Why do you feel that you, you are just in the present? Because this is when your memory is contracted to the maximum and all what you see now is simply the sensations and not anymore the sensations and their memories. Well, if you loosen up this thing a little bit, you will see the sensations and their memories in the same time. And this is what Bergson calls a déjà vu. You see the, in the crystal, you can see either the perception or the memory of the perception because they're happening at the same time. If you are inattentive a little bit or you loosen up your attention when it comes to perceptions, you start seeing the memory of the perception in the same time, and it gives you a, a, a tiny bit larger a plane of memory. But if you now you dilute your attention and start daydreaming about, I don't know, your vacations last summer, you see, you're starting now to, to bring in your last summer uh, vacation with some perception uh, happening now, with some other memories, and this is how you constitute another uh, contraction of memories, and uh, 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 you constitute by that, by this contraction, a plane of memory that will have its singular points, its characters, etc. I hope this is clear. So what Bergson is saying is this. He says... Uh, memory always have, if you want, the components or the constructive elements of memory. Memory always has a kind of anchor point, which is the S point, which is the anchor in what we call the present. And from that present, you can go and reach a plane of memory that you will explore. Uh, how do you explore a plane of memory? You start going from an important event to an important event, because this is how the memory planes are constituted. You don't remember everything in the plane. You just remember a number of crucial events, and this is how you, you explore a plane of uh, memory. So one of the ways to do that, if you take a movie, which is really like uh, modeled 
on the Bergsonian cone at Citizen Kane by Orson Welles. I hope you'll watch at least this movie by Orson Welles, which is Citizen Kane, knowing that Orson Welles only makes uh, masterpieces and wonderful movies. But if you want to watch one, please watch uh, Citizen Kane. So Citizen Kane is a story of what? Citizen Kane is a story of a guy which is a magna of uh, media. It's like a Hariri, if you want, uh, in the old days, who used to own a newspaper and a television and billions of dollars, uh, etc. So he's this kind of figure. He's a big uh, guy, a magna of uh, media. And, uh, or, and Citizen Kane, uh, he, he dies. Uh, at one point, he dies. And actually, the movie begins with the death of Citizen Kane. Please uh, turn off your mics if you have an open mic. So Citizen Kane dies at the beginning of the movie. And I don't know if this is a hazard. I don't think uh, so. But at the beginning of the movie, Citizen Kane is holding a crystal. And when he dies, the crystal falls and the room is filled with uh, snow. And this is the real beginning of the movie. And the movie is about knowing who Citizen Kane was, because when he was dying, or the last thing he said before dying, is the words, Rose Bud, the button of Rose. And the nurse heard him say Rose Bud. Of course, everyone is like, uh, everyone wants to know now, what is Rose Bud? So Rosebud is a problematic point. We don't know what is Rosebud. Uh, when you don't know, you have a problematic point. And we don't know what is Rosebud because on top of it, Citizen Kane is a very mysterious character. We really don't know exactly who he is. And this is when the movie begins as a series of explorations of the planes of memory related to Citizen Kane. I hope at least you get now the structure of this movie narration. And the movie is really about going and meeting people who knew Citizen Kane and asking them, do you know anything about Rosebud? Because before he died, he said Rosebud. I would like to know what is Rosebud. It, mu it must be something very important. And indeed, we start exploring these planes of memory. Now, this is for, if you want, the narration. Now, how is the movie structured? Uh, this is when Citizen Kane shows his, you know, his virtuosity. Because to have as an object, I want to explore memory is easy, you know. Uh, you can say, I'm interested in memory. Uh, who is not interested in memory, you know. Uh, uh, no worries. Okay, you can leave for 10 minutes. Um, uh, so, uh, so you see, it's quite easy, I say, to pick as an object memory. But, but the, the real creative work and the difficulty of becoming a great movie maker or artist is how are, you gaming, how, how are you going to be able to give shape to that object in a movie painting, sculpture, or whatever. And I think Citizen Kane really invented the memory uh, image type for cinema. Uh, the first thing that Citizen Kane used to do, for example, is to lower the ceilings, which is it's, it's a very peculiar feature. Uh, if you watch Citizen Kane, the scene where he is uh, celebrating the acquisition of his first newspaper, uh, Citizen Kane told his, uh, you know, his uh, decorateur, his uh, interior designer, to build the ceiling at 2 meter 20. It gives you this kind of very compressed space as if, as if it's a plane. And why is he doing that? It's not a formal thing like, you know, plane of memory and plane, so you bring down the ceiling. Uh, why is he doing that? He's doing that because it is a, because Orson Welles knows that in memory, you go from one luminous point to the other. I explain. Uh, let's suppose you are remembering this party you went to last uh, two years ago where your girlfriend ended up going with another guy. Okay, so th the girlfriend ended up leaving you with another guy at that party. This is a luminous point. Now, how do you remember the party? You don't remember it like, you know, you're dressing and you're going and you're picking her and you go to the party. You don't remember your 
night like that, you remember first the first important event. It is the night where she left me. And then you remember the sub-events, you know, like, how did she leave me? First, she started to, to dance with him, first luminous point. And then while I was walking, I heard people laughing at me, second luminous point. And the next day, I knew that actually my friend introduced him to her, third luminous point. And you see that actually now, from the vantage point of memory, when you remember the, the scene, you go from one luminous point to the other. So actually what Orson Welles does, and this is why he brings down the ceiling, because he makes lateral travelings. Why does he make a lateral travelling? Because he knows where he wants to go and gets the information. It's not like an action movie at all. It's not that li like you're moving in the party and then things start to unfold step by step. It's not like that at all. It's that I know that the guy there in the corner was gossiping on me, so the camera goes there, it fetches this information. Then I know that actually my friend introduced this other guy to my girlfriend, so the camera goes there and fetches this information. Then it goes and pick the scene where she's dancing with him, and then when she kissed him, etc. And this is how you explore your memory. You see, one of the ways to go is to explore a plane of memory, and this is a well-defined plane. So its contraction is quite solid. It's like an A second, B second contraction because, you know, you are only in that plane and you're not mixing planes together. I hope you, you, you got the first uh, way to go. When you explore a plane, you connect the luminous point in the plane. Now you have another way to do it, which is to contract a sequence. Between in the same plane, instead of picking the luminous point, you can contract the sequence. And this is another treatment that Orson Welles does, uh, which was known for the depth of field, uh, 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 profondeur de champ. And what is the depth of field? Uh, the depth of field is that the many actions that led to a luminous point are filmed in one shot. I explain. Uh, if you take the scene of the suicide of the wife of Orson Welles, uh, there's a scene where the wife of Orson Welles, meaning Citizen Kane, commits suicide. And actually, how does Orson Welles film that? He films it by putting the camera next to the poisoned cup. So what do you see? We'll see this image uh, soon. You see the cup the dead woman or half dead woman, then you see the door and you hear Citizen Kane knocking or banging on the door to open it because he's feeling that there's something wrong. So you see from the memory vantage point, and this is what I would really like you, I hope, if not, let me know, to become sensitive to is that if you want to film it memory-wise, you film it from the most important point and backwards. Well, if you want to film it as an action, you film it forward, meaning action treatment. What would you film? You would film uh, Citizen Kane coming home. He puts his jacket on the chair. He goes to the room. He tries to open the door, but it's not opening. He calls, he knocks, and then he breaks in the room. He walks towards his wife, he sees that she's half dead, and then, puff, he discovers the poison cup. This would be an action movie. Now, if you remember the sequence, how do you remember? You say, ah, yes, it was the day when she tried to commit suicide with poison, so you're already there. And if you're already there, you put your camera into the most important place, which is the poison cup, and you film it as if you are coming towards the event. Orson Welles did it also uh, uh, with another scene where he, uh, he has a fight or a breakup with his best friend. You see that Orson Welles uh, is moving in and then the camera goes towards and waits for Orson Welles next to the head of his friend. And then you see Orson Welles coming and he breaks up with his friend. So before seeing the images, I'll just uh, uh, would like to add another treatment, uh, which is the way he uses light. Uh, given that you are in the memory plane, 
and things get actualized and virtualized most of the time. See, I remember my friend and then puff, he disappears, and I remember something else, so on and so forth. What Orson Wentz does is that he redefines people by putting the light source in their back. And hence, what they do is that sometimes they become shadows and sometimes they become real. So when you're a shadow, you are really pushing back from the source of light, which is, he puts it in the front, and uh, you become like Ombre uh, Chinoise. And then when he is becoming actualized in memory, he, he is lit by a frontal light, and this is what makes him real. And you have this game on these shadowy figures becoming real and not becoming real, which really gives you this kind of feel of uh, the, the being in a memory kind of calm. So I will show you these shots uh, for you to see them. Uh, I'll show you the shots of the suicide, where you see how we have this depth of feel. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the most important part. Uh, what does it mean? It means that we don't care if he's a capitalist and he's an individualist and all these things you read about Orson Welles. All of this is fine. This is part of the theme. But this doesn't make it a, a, a movie per se, nor a memory movie. What's interesting is why does he put the camera next to the cup? Uh, most people think it's just because it's cool. Uh, I'm trying to explain to you that no, it's not just because it's cool, because actually the reality of, re of exploring memory obliges, in a way, to put the camera next to the most important event. And this is how you are in memory, in the image, and not just anymore, you know, in speech. So, uh, So this is uh, the contraction with the poison uh, cup. I hope you see where he plays the, the, the camera. Yeah, one, two, three. Perfectly all right in a day or two, Mr. Kane. Okay. Uh, this is one depth of field. I'll show you uh, the other one. Uh, and I hope here you, you'll notice the treatment of shadows and lights. And then the depth of field. Mr. Leland is writing it from the dramatic angle. Yeah, yeah. and we've covered it from the news end. Naturally. And the social. How about the music notice? Got that in? Oh, yes, that's already made up. Uh, Mr. Merwin wrote a swell review. Enthusiastic? Yes, sir. Naturally. Mr. Ratzin. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kane. Hello, 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 this is a surprise. Done exactly. Right, 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 We've got two spreads of pictures. That's fine. The music notice on the front page. Yes, Mr. Kane. But there is still one notice to come. The dramatic. Dramatic notice? Bernstein, that's Mr. Leland, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Kane, we're waiting for him. Where is he? Right in there, Mr. Kane. Mr. Kane. Mr. Kane. Mr. Leland and Mr. Kane, they haven't spoken together for years. You don't suppose? Nothing to suppose. Excuse me. Close the door. 
Okay, I hope you're getting it. Uh, you have the low ceiling, section point, the camera next to the, uh, to the event, which is meaningful, etc. So if you want, this is uh, uh, the first way to go. First way to go is, uh, as you see in Orson Welles, you can explore a plane of memory by going from one important event to the other. We didn't see that scene, but you'll be able to see it in Citizen Kane when you watch the movie. Uh, and then you have uh, the contractions, meaning you put the important event and then how you discover it in reverse, because this is how we remember. We always remember in reverse in relation to the important event. The important event comes first to our memory, and then we remember how we got there. And the third point that we didn't see yet is that sometimes you can contract two planes of memory. And this is uh, what sometimes, uh, what gives you the dream effect, even though it's not a dream at all and it's not an anamorphosis. I explain. If you watch, and I hope you'll watch this one too, which is absolutely uh, great. If you watch uh, the movie The Trial, which is a movie on the trial of Kafka and the absurdities of the law, etc. Uh, this is the theme if you want, but uh, Orson Welles deals with it as a memory image. Because at one point, yeah, you also have low ceilings, light, etc. Profondeur uh, de champ, so all the tricks that he uses to, to, to deal with memory. But at one point, you have a scene where, uh, uh, where you have the guy talking to his uncle at work as if he was a child uh, talking to his uncle in a kitchen. So when you have this kind of mixture of planes, your memory is here more diluted. I hope now you're getting these contractions. In Citizen Kane, you have well-contracted memories, meaning you are in a plane that corresponds more or less to the actual chronological time at sections. While in the trial, the dilution is bigger because you start seeing things mixing together. You see, actually, while you are at work or while you are at home in the trial, you see things that come from your childhood, and when you are at work, you see your uncle coming from your childhood or from your, uh, even when you are really young, and all your memories are getting mixed together, and you have this kind of confusion between the memories. Okay, so I hope uh, you're getting this uh, idea, which is actually what makes many people think that dreams are, uh, are, or are made of these, these mixture. I explain. Uh, if you take uh, the book by Freud, you know, the, 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 uh, the analysis of dreams, or it's not the analysis of dreams, it will come back to me, you know, the, his book on dreams, the, anyway, uh, he wrote a book on dreams, uh, Freud, and I think this book is really perfect not to analyze dreams, but to, anal to analyze the workings of memory. Because memory, which is a power, and Freud saw that very well and he analyzed it in a very, very precise way. Freud says, well, you know, your memory is able to contract things. Uh, your uncle is mixed with a dolphin in your dream. Or your memory is able to contract epochs. You're wearing your suit uh, of graduation, but you are, uh, uh, you know, drinking milk in the kitchen of your grandma. So you have these contractions. Your memory is able to do a kind of a, a malaxage. It's able to fold things on each other and to distantiate things from each other. What is usually coming together becomes separated and what is separated comes together. So all of these are the workings of memory. And Fred, I think if you read, if you read his, uh, his uh, book on dreams, he really like made or a kind of uh, a list of all the workings of memory. Now, of course, memory is what contracts. It is what has luminous point. It is what folds and unfolds. It is what makes the, the near close and the distant, uh, the, the near distant and the distant close. This is the workings of memory. But this working of memory can be taken into an anamorphic transformation. This is what you need to be sensitive to. For example, in your dream, if you dream that you are 
I don't know, sucking your thumb while you are wearing your suit, like when you were two years old, but uh, you, are in your uni you are now in university. This is what you call a contraction. It's not an anamorphosis, and the dream has nothing to do with that. On the other hand, if while you are sucking your thumb, this thing transforms into, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, into a dolphin uh, biting the leg of a, of a whale, you have this relation. Well, this is an anamorphosis. And what you need to see in the images is you need to, to distinguish this from that. Many people think that uh, Orson Welles makes surrealist images because they look like dreams, but, but no. Uh, first, surrealism is not anamorphosis. This is the first point. And the second point is that anamorphosis is not what is only present in the dream. Because in the dream, which is a kind of general relaxation of your sensory motor structure, what happens is that images start to interact together by following the powers of time in this, in this case. And you have the interactions of two powers when you dream, the workings of memory and the dream work, both. So when in the dream you move from Okay, I'm talking with my uncle uh, at work, but he's from my childhood. This is a contraction of memory. But if the office transforms into a boat, this is an anamorphosis. This is a real workings of the uh, dream. So I hope these distinctions are clear now, because we really, really we are like, uh, I don't know what to say. We are just like longing for a, a language on art, which is not only, well, you know what, this is a classical movie or a classical art, like it's normal, and this is surreal. Because usually these are the two categories. When you hear uh, art critics or artists, either he does, you know what, realist movies or art, or he is, uh, you know, surreal. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that, well, no. You have so much more, and surrealism is only one of these. And it's not even what uses the dream fully. Surrealism uses the dream sometimes. Uh, when, when, uh, when I think Oppenheimer makes this cup with fur on it, it's not a dream image. Uh, it's simply a surrealist image because it mixes together the fur with an everyday object. So this is what you call, uh, uh, this is what you call uh, uh, a surrealist uh, uh, object but it's not an oniric object. On the other hand, you could have oniric treatments inside a surrealist painting, like what Dali does. For example, Dali, I'll try to show you one. Uh, uh, these are anamorphoses by Dali. I wish I would have better one. Uh, so if you look at that, it's an anamorphosis. I would like to see other. Now, this one is an anamorphosis. You have the face which is taken into these uh, things. So you have this transformation from face to paysage. But in the same time, he uses the anamorphic treatment in order to reveal another world, which is the world of the origins. So as you can see, not all anamorphoses lead to a revelation of another world. Dali does it in order to, re to reveal another world because he's interested into these, uh, uh, the uh, surrealist structure of the image. Uh, on the other hand, you could have, uh, you could have something like that, which is Oppenheimer's cup. You don't have an anamorphosis, it's not a dream. All what you have is a collapse between an everyday object and the furry stuff which evoke animality, the jungle or whatever, which is the originary work, okay? Uh, uh, and what you're seeing now, and what you'll see now in the movie clip by Orson Welles is, uh, well, it's neither nor. It's a contraction of two planes of memory, uh, like in the scene where he meets his, uh, his uh, his uh, uncle. Um, so this is the scene, I'll show it to you. Uh, uh, where 
is it? Um, so, one second. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. But unfortunately, I don't have it. Um, we can Google it if you want. No, it's a section of a movie, so... But apparently, I don't know why I thought I made the cut. So I'll have to describe it to you. You imagine it. So it's, uh, it's, in, uh, it's in the trial. And uh, in the trial, he makes this kind of, uh, he shoots a scene where the main character is meeting his uncle, and they start to speak about, uh, about uh, you know, uh, uh, about uh, jam and butter and, uh, you know, stuff like that, uh, as if they are sitting in the kitchen of his mother. So this is when you have the, uh, the contraction of two planes. Uh, I hope this is uh, clear, so I don't have it. Anyway, so uh, so this is for the contraction, okay? So I hope by now we understood more or less how this works. Now, if you take citizen K, if you take Orson Welles, Orson Welles really deals with well-defined memories, and the memories with which Orson Welles uh, deals with are uh, memories of people like Citizen Kane or uh, the guy in the trial. Uh, or there are the memories of a family, like, uh, let's say, the, uh, uh, like in the movie, the, 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 uh, uh, the great, uh, the, the Anderson uh, movie. So, so um, The Splendor of the Andersons is a movie about a very rich family, and this family disappeared. And this is when you have what we call a, a movie about a family, and it talks about the possibilities of uh, remembering or not. So now I'm going to move to another author, which also deals with memory, which is uh, Alain René. Now, Alain René is one of these big uh, movie makers who dealt with uh, uh, memory. And Alain René, contrary to Orson Welles, usually you don't have a defined or a well-defined character or family that will allow you to go into the exploration of memory. So it's a kind of uh, memory which is either impersonal or a memory which is the memory of many people together or the memory of two lovers together or a memory which is triggered by a machine. So you can see it's not really a kind of uh, personal memory. So, if you take the movie uh, Je t'aime, je t'aime. Now, the movie Je t'aime, je t'aime, uh, the story is about a guy who is in doubt as to the fact, as to knowing if he did kill or he didn't kill his girlfriend. Now, why is it uh, this way? Because uh, uh, his girlfriend told him to turn off the gas, the, you know, the heater, before he goes out of the room, and he's uh, and the next day they found her dead uh, by asphyxiation in the room, and he's unable to remember if he turned off the gas or not, or if it's the wind who turned off the gas and the gas was still uh, getting out, and given that he's unable to remember if he did it or not, this is what you call a problematic point, he needs to go in his memory to find out if he left out the gas or he didn't leave it out. Now, in order to do that, uh, given that he was very tormented, etc., he commits suicide, or at least he tries to commit suicide. 
And then there's a bunch of scientists who recuperate him, and they tell him that we have a machine called the new sphere that will allow you to travel in your memory and go wherever you want, uh, not wherever you want, because the machine is not very, very well good, uh, very well tuned yet, but the machine will send you in your memory, and maybe this way you'll be able to find uh, the missing memory. And uh, this is when uh, Alain René introduces this uh, montage, which is not only an Alain René, but an Alain René in Jetem Jetem, it's very, very obvious, which is what you call the irrational cut. So I'll show you this clip and you will see what is an irrational cut. It is when you have a sequence that cuts, you don't know where or when or why, and you go into another sequence. And Alain is doing like that because memory itself is irrational, meaning it doesn't stop where it has to stop. It just cuts in a random way, and it takes you to places, in this case to memories, uh, randomly. And this is really like uh, pictured in uh, Je t'aime, je t'aime. It's again, it's an incredible movie. If you want to have a beautiful night, you watch that. And this is a clip from uh, Je t'aime, uh, je t'aime. And I hope you notice the irrational cut. Now, the images you are seeing here is the images that the guy who is in the machine is seeing because the machine is sending him to places, to his memories. I hope you, 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 you're getting uh, why these are irrational cuts. You see, there's absolutely no reason why you would go from him shooting to the gazon and then back and forth. And uh, an irrational cut, this is a technical word that it's good for you to know, is when you don't cut in accordance to the concept. What, this is a negative definition. A positive definition is that the cut is neither part of the first series nor part of the last series, meaning you don't know where it's gonna, uh, where it's gonna uh, fall, i.e. you can cut anywhere in the sequence and begin a sequence anywhere. This is the definition of the irrational cut. Now, why Alain René is doing that? Because he is uh, really like exploring the way memory works. You go from one plane to the other in a random, irrational uh, way. So one of the features that Alain René does is this kind of impersonal memory, which is grounded on, uh, on the machine. Uh, in the scenario, he needs a machine to, to, to make memory, like to liberate the cuts of memory, to let memory go wherever it wants in a random way. 
And this is when memory goes crazy. So the whole movie is about these sections of memories and you jump from one plane to the other, uh, which is in Jetem Jetem. Now, another very interesting treatment, I think, is in uh, Muriel. Now, what is the story of Muriel? Uh, it's the story of a woman who has a son. Uh, the son is engaged with La Guerre d'Algérie, so it's in the 60s, uh, uh, while the boyfriend of the mother, which is also a very uh, an undefined character because we don't know if he's really the boyfriend because it's a guy who comes back and he tells her, you remember me, and she doesn't know, not really, but maybe he's her girlfriend, not her girlfriend. So anyway, even the character is problematized in this way. And the character is from the Second World War. So you have now two planes of memory. And she, the woman, Muriel, she didn't participate in any uh, wars. Now, what's interesting in Muriel, and I hope you will notice it, Deleuze writes about it, is that the, the furniture is moving all the time in the house. So, you know, when the guy moves in, they remove the furniture. When the sun comes, they move the furniture. And you feel, as Deleuze says, that you don't really have a fixed anchor point. So I explain. Uh, me, I'm sure you hear a lot about, you know, uh, the memory of Lebanon and how it's important to have a memory and stuff like that. Uh, I give you the example of Solidaire. Uh, if you take Solidaire, what's the problem with Solidaire? Uh, some people say, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a shame they destroyed the old buildings. Fine. So, but what's the problem in destroying the old buildings? Uh, if, you, if you stay at that level, it becomes like a fetishism of old buildings. Now, if you want to access something alive, something living behind the, 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 behind the destruction of the old buildings, the problem is that when you wipe up a city like Hariri did in Solidaire, you know, Solidaire was more or less uh, not Solidaire, the downtown was still okay, but uh, Hariri came and he bulldozed everything. And when he bulldozed everything, what he did is that he destroyed the anchor points of the memory between the generations. What does it mean? It means that, uh, let's suppose you, your dad used to eat, I don't know, uh, uh, his manouche uh, next to the cinema, I don't know what, in downtown, in the old Beirut city center, where you don't have access to that anymore. So if you have an ice cream shop, like what happened today with the Beirut blast, you know, you have the Helmi ice cream uh, shop. Maybe your dad, your grandma, mother and father used to eat ice cream from there. And this was an anchor point, meaning you can go with them and eat your ice cream and you will have memories connected to that point. Now, the problem is that when you destroy a city or key places in a city, what will happen is that the next generation will not have anymore the same anchor points as the first generation. And this is why you have a problem. Why you have a problem? Because this is how you isolate the generations from one another. And this is where the real politics begins. The real politics is that, okay, I don't have any more shared memories with my grandfather, father, uh, etc. And so, so what can I do? Uh, so you see, they live in a memory plane where they have their memories anchored in this downtown that doesn't exist anymore. And you have your memories anchored somewhere else. And if you go to the downtown, it has nothing to do with the previous one. And have, you have these cuts between uh, generations. Now, this is, if you want, the real problem behind memory. And if you're an artist and you want to deal with that, one of the questions would be, yeah, but how can I reconnect that or how can I show that? I hope you're getting now real problematics pertaining to memory, which are a bit, I think, uh, more problematic and interesting and motivating than, well, you know what, we have to preserve the old buildings. Right? We have to preserve the old buildings, yes, fine, but why? What is at stake? What is at stake is really uh, the building of a transgenerational memory. Now, you can show either the cuts, and Alain René made uh, two movies on that. One of them is Muriel, where he shows you that the different generations of the French uh, uh, soldiers, in quote, are disconnected, and hence you have a conflict between the generations. And he did another one on uh, Spain, 
uh, unfortunately I forgot the name, but you can Google it, where he shows you that in Spain you have also many politicized generations, but each one of these generations has its own fight. So one of them is fighting with the Basques, another one is fighting against Franco, a third one is fighting uh, in the Second World War, and you have this kind of scattering of the generations. And the whole problem be becomes how can you connect the generations together, because or else you can't have a unified uh, politics. Now, I hope you're getting how you articulate uh, that. Now, Alain René, who dedicated his life to explore the memory image, all his movies are about memory, like all of them, uh, one of his take is that memory sometimes is impersonal. It can be played between two persons. That's, that's fine. You know, wh what does it mean to play memory between two persons? You know, it's like when you sit next to the fire and you start telling your cousin, hey, you remember when we went? And he tells you, yeah, I remember, and you remember, and I remember. This is a memory at two. Uh, uh, I think a very interesting take on that is uh, Hiroshima Mon Amour. Uh, in Hiroshima Mon Amour, where you have Nevers and Hiroshima, uh, you have these two lovers, and you have a memory at two where uh, the guy is refusing to remember anything with the woman, but the woman which is there in Japan starts to remember Nevers, where she was in France, by looking at Japan, I meaning she sees a river and you have it traveling on the river and it takes you to the river in Nevers. So you see here is a function of the traveling. Uh, yeah. see, traveling is a very delicate thing, it's like language. Huh? Because traveling on a river can make you connect two memories. And this is how you connect two memories or a perception of the memory in this case. You make a traveling to bring together the far uh, what is far and to make it near, meaning Japan, France. Uh, René made a movie like that on uh, on uh, Van Gogh, and he makes he makes traveling on his paintings. But his traveling passes from one painting to the other, and you start to see, given that the movement of the camera is continuous, you start to see how Van Gogh, let's say, early paintings are connected to the later paintings because you're able to move in this continuous movement from one painting to the other. And these travelings that René does on the paintings of, uh, of uh, Van Gogh are actually a commentary on the history of the works of Van Gogh. So I'm just giving you here uh, you know, some tricks about that. Uh, another very interesting movie, still with these memories at two and connecting two memories together, is, of course, uh, L'année dernière à Marianne Bad. And in Lani Maria Marianne Bad, you have the whole, uh, a lot of memory treatments in it. But one of the interesting one is that the hypnosis scenes, because uh, the guy apparently remembers who the woman is, but the woman is unable to remember who the man is. So you have two disjoint planes of memory now. It's a memory at two, but you have a guy who remembers and a woman who doesn't remember, and by forcing the woman to go and try to remember who he is. This is when the woman starts to get dizzy and she's completely hypnotized and hypnosis comes from uh, uh, from that. So I force you to go and look for a memory, but you're unable to find it and you keep going inside your memory in and out and you're unable to find that uh, uh, memory. Now, another very interesting treatment in, uh, in uh, L'année dernière à Marianne Bad is the traveling that connect the scene uh, before the event happens. Uh, I explain. So you have a camera that is traveling and it picks conversations and it goes back to where it was. And this is how uh, you, you feel that you are in a plane of frozen time and the camera is exploring these, uh, these uh, uh, sections. Um, So do I have this one? Uh, so I think it's this one, Eleni Danier, Amarinba. Uh, 
I hope it's this one. Uh, well, it's not it. So anyway, I think it's this one. So I'll try this one. So anyway, so uh, so I'll show you now uh, a last treatment of what Rene does is that he thinks that memory can connect planes not only between people and groups and um, and uh, many people etc, but memory can connect different species. So memory is not just you know the proper of man or happens between humans being, but memory as a power can connect man, men and rats, for example. Because inside man, you still something, you still have something of a rat. Meaning our reactions, our impulsive mind or our reptilian brain, as they call it, is a residue of what? Of the rat in us or of a species which is uh, not as evolved as what we are, even though it's still there. So what René does, another thing, is that he shows you how the world as you know it, be it a city or you or any object, is actually made of layers of memory. So if you take Beirut, you know, Beirut, you have many layers. So you have the French colonial part with the Ottoman part, with the modern part, with the war part, with the post-war part, and this is how you have a city. If you look at the city carefully, you see that it's layered. And if you have the eye for that, you'll see that it's a sedimentation of time. What connects all these parts is the memory. Now, when it comes to, to a species like the human being, well, it's the same. You have a part which is still a rat. You have another part which is a monkey. You have a third part which is a, properly a human being. And you have all these parts which are co-inhabiting in the same creature or object. And you can show that. If you show that, you are in the memory type because you see, you show the different layers of memory in the same time. So I'll show you here the, the treatments that Alain René did for that, where, you sh where, where he shows you that there is still a rat inside you. So this is from Monon de l'Amérique. I hope you'll understand why this is a memory image uh, and start looking at the images thinking about that. Quand on prend un rat, qu'on le met dans une cage à deux compartiments, c'est-à-dire qu'on l'espace est séparé par une cloison dans laquelle se trouve une porte dont le plancher est électrifié intermittemment. Et avant que le courant électrique passe dans le grillage du plancher, un signal prévient l'animal qui se trouve dans la cage que quatre secondes après, le courant va passer. Mais il ne sait pas au départ. Il s'en aperçoit vite. Au début, il est inquiet. Et très rapidement, il s'aperçoit qu'il y a une porte ouverte et il passe dans la pièce à côté. La même chose va se reproduire quelques secondes après. Mais il apprendra aussi très vite qu'il peut éviter la punition du petit choc électrique dans les pattes en passant dans le compartiment de la cage où il était au début. Cet animal qui subit cette expérience pendant une dizaine de minutes par jour, pendant sept jours consécutifs, au bout de ces sept jours, va être en parfait état, en parfaite santé. Son poil est lisse, il ne fait pas d'hypertension artérielle, il a évité par la fuite la punition. Il s'est fait plaisir, il a maintenu son équilibre biologique.
So I hope you got the example. So you have much more in that. But the idea is this. You, 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 he films how the rat behaves in the lab, and then he transposes that into real life. And you show that actually we human beings, when it comes to our personal relations, our professional relations, etc., well, we behave like rats. There's absolutely no difference between us and the rats when it comes to that level. And this shows you that there's something common between you and the uh, rat. So I hope this is clear. So you have all these forms of memory, you know, the impersonal memory where you're alone with a machine, memories at two as in Hiroshima and Amour, memories between the species like uh, Monogue d'Amérique, and this is when you really do your work on uh, memory. One of the best movies of René on memory, I think, is called The Providence, where you really see uh, all the tricks of memory, contractions, compression, exploration of uh, planes, uh, mixture between memories of two people and more. And you see all of that uh, really in uh, Providence, if you want to watch also a beautiful uh, movie. So this is, if you want, the first total. The first totality then is the totality of memory, and memory itself is like a totality where you have all your memories, all the memories of the, all the human beings together, all the memories of all the living together, this forms totalities. The second totality I'd like to talk about before we, we close this session is what we call the totality of the present. So you have two, two totalities. The totality of the past, memory, and the totality of the present, uh, which is the present. And you see, when it comes to the present as a totality, it's very difficult to get it as a totality. What does it mean? You see, we, we know the present normally, meaning we know the present as uh, informed by chronological time, meaning the present is not the past and it's moving towards the future, by the sensory motor organization, which is I'm acting and I'm, you know, building a future by using my past, and with rationality, meaning the present is actually where rationality is installed step by step by following rational cuts. This is how we know the present. What Rob Grier would like to show, Rob Grier is one of the authors of the present as totality and not the present as a point, a fluent point in time. The present as a fluent point in time will take you back to the classical image, meaning, you know, you have the succession of the presents one after the other in conformity to the concept. And this is how you get your story. Rob Grier says, well, you know what, there's something in this world, which is the pure presence of things. And already you feel that this, you need to go a bit outside of your rational box to, to get that. Now, what is the pure presence of thing? Uh, now to do that, you can try it with your desk. You know, you're sitting here and your desk is there. And your desk will be here when you die. And it will always be here. And it doesn't care about you. And this is the pure presence of things. So uh, I repeat, uh, you see, this is very different from, let's say, your tools, which are very familiar and, uh, and to which you relate only as tools. You know, when you use your phone or you use your chair, you have, you know, uh, emotional relations to your tools, be it your car, your phone, your computer, I don't know what, your desk, your room. This is when you're not seeing, you're not seeing the world yet as pure, brutal presence with or without you and not caring about you. And Rob Grier in the post-World War II, we're all in that time, is really interested in that. Like, how can I look at something without projecting on it, you know, all my emotions, utilities, uh, uh, Red, uh, meaning, uh, all of these things. Like you look at something, you oh yeah, it's a desk. Or you look at the phone, you say, oh yeah, it's a phone. So the whole issue is how can I look at something, whatever it is, uh, be it a plant, an animal, or a thing, or even a human being, how can I look at them as pure presences without meaning? 
And this is where Robri, see, so I hope you're getting the first layer of the problem of Robri. How can I reach things as they are? As they are as pure presences and not vehicle or tokens or signs for meanings and usefulness and and then. So I can reach this pure brutality of the presence. This is, if you want, his project. But this project is deeper. This is when you get to the real problem of an artist. This is what you were supposed to do in your essays. Uh, project. You have them typed in the notes. So, Rabrier's issue here apparently is to reach pure presence. Yeah, but, but why? And here, Rabrier, he goes into a critique of literature that shows you actually that literature, until Rabrier, is actually contaminated by metaphysics. Because whenever you use a metaphor, you're actually saying without knowing it most of the time or while knowing it most of the other times that you are humanizing nature. I explain. When you say, for example, the mountain is standing like an old man or, or the mountain is dignified or the mountain is, uh, I don't know, beautiful, all, all of these things. Actually, you are attributing to the mountain human characteristics where you believe that between you and the mountain there's a kind of complicity. So you are human and the mountain has something human. And this kind of complicity between man and nature, it's or points towards the divine origin, which is the origin that created man and nature. This is why you're able to do uh, metaphor. So I read you the text on metaphors. Uh, <clears throat> Rob Grier writes, if you want to write one book, only one uh, to read, only read one book. If you want to understand the methodology of creating artworks used in this class extensively, read uh, 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 Pour un nouveau roman or for a new novel by Rob Grier. It's like a school book for artists, like how an artist should proceed and have a beautiful life. Read this book because you see how you do, how you pick a problem, you find a plastic solution, you find your allies, your enemies, and you're able to analyze all of that in a very concrete and, you know, palpable way. So, uh, 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 Rob Lee says, metaphor, as a matter of fact, is never an innocent figure of speech. To say that the weather is capricious or the mountain majestic, to speak of the heart of the forest or of a pitiless sun, of a village huddled in the valley, is to a certain degree to furnish clues as to things themselves, shape, size, situation. But the choice of an analogical vocabulary, however simple, already does something more then account for purely physical data, and what this more is can scarcely be ascribed only to the credit of belles meaning there's something much more dangerous going on when you do a metaphor. The height of the mountain assumes willy-nilly a moral value. The heat of the sun becomes the result of an intention in almost the whole of our contemporary literature, the anthropomorphic analogies are repeated too insistently, too coherently, not to reveal an entire metaphysical system. And what is this metaphysical system that uh, Rob Rier is talking about? Is the, uh, is, the, is the posture where man and nature are created by the same God, and this is why they have this kind of harmony and dialogue between each other. If you remember uh, uh, Eisenstein, la non indifférente nature, nature is not indifferent to us. This is already a, a theological uh, uh, as a position. So the metaphysics behind that is this complicity between things and man which can only be justified by the metaphysics of the Christian, Judaic, and Islamic uh, uh, vantage point, 
uh, including some of Aristotle, Aristotle, uh, Aristotle. Fine. So how can you go beyond that? Uh, and I hope you're getting now his real problem. His real problem is that the history of metaphysics, as Heidegger will say, or said earlier than Hobbes, Heidegger said the history of metaphysics is the history of the forgetfulness of being, meaning of what there is. Uh, this is how Robbe reads it from Heidegger, because he mentions Heidegger uh, many times. And uh, the reading of Robbe of, uh, of Robbe when it comes to Heidegger is that uh, being is pure, what is purely present there. Heidegger will not accept that, but uh, we don't care at this point. Uh, the, the idea is that there's a withdrawal of things as they are because we always cover them with meaning. And the meaning coming from the Judeo-Christian tradition. And if you want to make a literature that is not accomplice, is not collaborating with the Judeo-Christian tradition, you will have to find something other than the metaphor. Now, I hope you're getting how things become parallel. So your problem now is the Judeo-Christian metaphysics. You don't want anymore to live in this world which is enchanted and governed by God for a hundred reasons. You're, you are a man of literature, so you'd like now to localize this problem in your domain. How is religion manifested in your domain? For, uh, for Rabbi, it's manifested as the use of the metaphor. Because in the metaphor and all these images that some people find beautiful because, you know, uh, they are well said and they open on the imagination, etc. Uh, Rabbi says this is a symptom of, uh, of being still religious. And hence, in order to solve this problem and get out of that, what does he need to do? He needs to invent a way of writing which has nothing of a narrative or of a metaphor. You see how difficult it is. He needs to invent a way of writing which is not just absolutely boring, uh, because this is the, the other danger. You start just writing things which are absolutely useless. So he needs to discover something which is not a narrative, and not metaphorical in order to access a literature which is outside of uh, religion and the metaphysical veiling of presence. Now you get into the techniques. How is he going to do that? His method is pure description. So Rabri says, in order to break all our associative thinking and our metaphorical thought, we need to destroy the the, the propensity to do that. You need to destroy the tendency to, when you look at your phone, to say, ah, it's a phone. You see, it's very difficult to reach presence because we are so much taken by our sensory motor organization, metaphorical thinking, and uh, metaphorical analogical thinking, and by the usefulness of the world that we're unable to just look at something as just what it is. So to break this tendency, Rogri says his solution in literature is pure description, meaning I'm going to describe the distances of things. How does he do that? He says, uh, I'll read you the text of this way of pure description that destroys its object, but creates another object, which is the object which is only present. So I'll read you that. Uh, so, so this is the text by Rob Grier. It's from La Jalousie. Uh, it's in English, but anyway. So he's describing the garden next to his house. And I hope you see how he's destroying the garden while creating another garden. Now the shadow of the southwest column at the corner of the veranda on the bedroom side falls across the garden. The sun, still low in the eastern sky, rakes the valley from the side. The rows of banana trees, 
growing at an angle to the direction of the valley are everywhere quite distinct in this light. From the bottom to the upper edge of the highest sectors on the hillside facing the one the houses build on, it is relatively easy to count the trees, particularly opposite the house, thanks to the recent plantings of the patches located in this area. And it goes like that for 300 pages. After 300 pages, you really feel that you are in a purely physical world of brutal presence. You see, all, what he's doing, he's describing the distances. So if you take this bottle or this phone, instead of saying, ah, it's a phone, you start saying the straight line that curves at an angle, and then you have a radius which is rounded, prolonged by another line. You have a fall, a recession, two spheres, etc., etc. And this is when your phone starts to be or appear to you as a purely presence, as a, as a presence. So Rodrigue in his books, he really like have a whole theory of how to make the world present again, because so far the world was made unpresent. And this is part of the whole conspiration of religion. Because when this word is not present anymore, it's simply something for something else. The word becomes a word for paradise or a word for hell. This is the referential relations that he wants to block. And you leave the world and all the forces of reaction, religious people and company, they're able to dominate in this world because this word is not anymore here. It's simply something that you have to step on to go somewhere else. So his books, Rob Grier, they deal with these uh, presences. And you have a lot of descriptions which are beautiful, where you really feel this kind of presence of things. The movies of Rob Grier, on the other hand, they deal with the present. Because you know, the problem with the present is that we're unable to put our hand on it. Uh, our language can't really describe the present. What does it mean? You see, my hand is moving. This is an event. If you say my hand is here, you lose the event. Because if you say my hand is here, it's not moving anymore. So what Gabriel says is that the present, as a pure instant, as a peak of present, as he calls it, to get that point of time, it's very difficult because you're all the time carried in history and the story. So if you want to reach this pure instant, you have to make like a freezing on the present. And to do that, you have another way of describing, which is the description of events. And here, Rob Grier calls for a friend, an ally, he says, Roussel, the writer, did it before me, when in his book, uh, La Vue, he writes like, he, he writes uh, uh, lengthy descriptions. Please close your mic. He writes mic. lengthy He writes lengthy How can I uh, do that? Uh, okay. okay, so... He has lengthy descriptions on, on uh, describing an event. Now, how does Roussel do that? Roussel, uh, uh, in La Vue, he's describing a tiny, tiny little scene that you can find uh, uh, in old uh, uh, pens. Uh, they used to put a crystal with a tiny little drawing in it, or a tiny little scene which are drawn on water bottles. In the good old days, they used to draw like little scenes on water bottles on the etiquette. And what Roussel does is that he describes the etiquette in the most minute details. And one of the ways to, or, or, or how does it sound like that? So you have an event and he starts going around it and around it to the point where this point of present becomes uh, uh, enduring in time. So he makes the present 
last in time by fixating it in a never-ending uh, uh, description. So I will read to you some of that by Roussel. Uh, so where is Roussel? <coughs> Uh, so this is from Levy, and he's describing this uh, little uh, scene, and I hope you'll feel how he's able to suspend the present. He says, uh, so it's a story about a guy smoking a cigar next to him. Qui tient entre ses dents un énorme cigare, il n'est pas fort à la question et se cas. Le mieux possible, dans un excellent fauteuil, il jette en l'air un calme et languissant coup d'œil pour suivre la fumée impalpable et légère qui s'éloigne de son visage et lui suggère mille rêves les plus doux et délicieux en montant avec des spirales vers les cieux. Sa cravate au repli combiné et bouffante d'arrangement classique et de forme savante, son gilet blanc semé de gros et sombres poids, le gêne par beaucoup de rêveurs et d'emplois. À sa droite, une femme est en robe voyante, l'étoffe est à la fois soyeuse et chatoyante, sa jupe a dans le bras droit, sa jupe a dans le bras trois ou quatre volants, peu froncée, ne sortant guère, plutôt collant. Elle est assise avec grâce et tient son ombrelle, debout en s'appuyant de ses deux mains sur elle. Elle garde ses bras allongés et tendus, et même quelque peu nonchalant et tordu. And it goes like that for pages and pages. So you see how, where, where he is tapping it. The other man smoking the cigar, he starts observing the distance of the smoke from the face and how the woman next to him is standing, what she's wearing, and he goes into the motif of the clothes. And all of these descriptions make this moment of the puff of the cigar last in time. So this is one of the techniques. Now, Robrier, one of his uh, allies, uh, you know, uh, he's really a fan of Beckett. Now, why is he a fan of Beckett? Because for Robrier, Beckett was able to bring presence and present in the same time. It's uh, especially in En Attendant Godot. So practically, what is the story of En Attendant Godot? Yeah. It's a three hours play where at the beginning of the play, they tell you that Godot will not come. So there's no need to wait for him. So you see in the narrative, you block the fact that Godot will come. And then what you see on scene, on stage, is two people who are there not doing anything for three hours. And Rob Rie says, this is the first time where we, were able, where we were able to look at people and just to look at them because they are neither characters, nor doing something, nor enacting a drama. They are just there standing on stage and after a while you start just looking at them as pure presences. This is, this is the first point. The second point is that in, in En Attendant Godot, he uses present techniques. Uh, for example, there is a scene where uh, a guy comes in and the two protagonists tell him to put down the bags. So he was carrying bags and they tell him put down the bags. And then they don't remember what they told him. Of course, why they don't remember? Because the characters of Beckett and also of Rob Grier, by the way, they don't have a memory because they live in the pure present. And when you live in the pure present, you can't remember what you say, etc. And this is when in Anatanon Godot, the two characters, they start making an incredible effort to remember what they told the guy who just came in. And this incredible effort takes 15 minutes on stage, which is a huge time. 15 minutes of these two guys just trying to remember what, just, what, what they just said. After 15 minutes of incredible efforts, one of them has an illumination and he says, oh yeah, we asked him to put down the bags. 
So the other character uh, says, uh, looks at him and then looks at the guy. And he tells him, no, it's impossible that we've asked him to put down the bags because look, the bags are, are on the floor. So if we ask him something, it can't be that because the bags are already here. And this is when they start to remember and try to remember again and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to tell you is very simple. Uh, uh, remember uh, when you go to, you know, you take a shower, you get out of the shower and you can't remember if you did your, your shampoo. It's the same. You know, I, you go into your shower, you go out, you can't remember, did I do my, did I do my hair? So I know maybe I didn't do it. You go back in, let's suppose you do it, you go out, you can't remember if you did it, you, you go back in. So these you see are loops. So why do you have these loops in the present? You have loops in the present because when you don't have a memory, you start looping on yourself and you don't know anymore if you did it or you didn't do it. And the pure present appears in these loops. This is one of the techniques. Rob Rier mentions something like 70 or more techniques to reach the pure present. I will not bore you with all of them. I hope you read the book or the notes in the, uh, in the uh, Deleuze notes. But you have a lot, a lot, a lot of techniques like uh, repeating the action or uh, being in, in a state of indecision. You don't know if you want to leave or you want to stay and you keep saying, I, I, I will leave, no, I will stay, I will leave, I will stay. All of these narrative techniques makes you uh, uh, just stand in the uh, present. So this is, if you want, uh, the, the two aspects of Robrier. But what's interesting for us is that Robrier films his movie in a way where he destroys all the sensory motor organization, which is actually the ground of chronological time. So he starts filming things which cannot be possibly happening in a chronological time. For example, he shows you a man here, then you have a traveling, and the same man is in the, in the other room. Then you have a traveling, you see him on the boat, and all of that is one in one continuous traveling. And all of these impossibilities destroy the chronological sensory motor organization of time. And you start seeing these images as pure presences on one side, and as being taken into a dilatation of the present, as if all of this is happening in the same time, if we can call it like that, and everything, you have these chunks. Uh, I'll give you another example. Robrier movies, I hope you'll watch some, like L'Immortel. In L'Immortel, you have a point of view on from the window. And whoever goes to the window, he sees the same thing. He sees the same point of view. So as if in this world, of pure presence, which is happening in the present, you know, each thing has its own perspective. So if I go to the window, what do I see? I see the deck with a chair all the time. If I go to the mosque, I always see the door. If I'm on the boat, I always see the house. So it's as if now the world is made of these pieces and only of these pieces which are purely presences which gives it a very strong feeling of closure. Why it's a feeling of closure? Because you're just living in these chunks, chunks of words, which are extracted by pure, pure descriptions, purely physical chunks of, of the world, and you live in these chunks. Now again, take it again. To, oh, yeah, again oh, yeah. And this is living like against the fact no, effect, against effects. Aff effects or affects? Uh, uh, sorry, affects. E emotions? Not emotions, Emo but Emo like les combattre somehow. Yeah, I didn't understand. Can you repeat, please? You're living against what? Les affects. Les affects. Oui, oui, yeah, les émotions. Or, or les oui. effets. Or Affect les émotions, les oui. émotions. Oui, les émotions et en, et en conséquent les, les, les effets de l'émotion. Oui, you're, you're in the sense of, uh, what are the, les, oui, yes, of course, all what he's saying, Robbie, is that this is a world 
It's not anymore the classical world where you have emotions, you move, etc. It's, it's not this world at all. It's a world of pure physicality. And indeed, the, the characters of Fabri are very cold and apathic. And they have a very weird sexuality too. If you are connected to emotions and ethics, they are pure bodies. Most of them are voyeurs. They just look at things. They're not driven by any desire to act, to change, or to do anything. And they live in this saturated world. What I'm trying to tell you is that to understand that you have to, to try to connect it to your life. Sometimes your life can turn into that. You know, you have your room that you see always like that. Then you go to your work from that street. And then you go back from this other street and you see these places with these people. And this is how you carve from the world a kind of world of pure presence. If on top of that you disconnect emotionally, narratively, historically from these chunks of world, you end up having what you call a totality of the present. Meaning you end up having a world which is only made by these purely physical chunks that you extract by description from the world. And this is how you build on top of the world this kind of presence, a world of presence which is completely closed. Now, to, to understand that, you have to watch uh, L'Immortel, where you see that actually Istanbul becomes like, uh, uh, I don't know, it's like a section, it's like a closed piece where people are moving as if they are in a 3D code. You, know, you go here, there, there, and you see this, that, that, and everything is described physically. You have very sharp shadows. People say very weird sentences. The story doesn't pile up. It's not that you, you know what is going on. No, you're taken to this repetition. You go here, there, there, and nothing is happening. But you see the things. You see the shadow on the mosque. You see it 10 times. You see the shadow on the deck. You see it 10 times, and the shadow doesn't move. Uh, most like of the time. Uh -huh. Like a cubist it's painting of some sort? No, not like a cubist painting at all, because cubist painting is the exact opposite. It's about movement, action, seeing things, and being in the flow of, of the uh, interactions. You know, as uh, if you remember, cubism was first taken as, a, as expressing the experience of the orgy, of this collective lovemaking, and it's definitely not this world of rigidified presences. You see, in the cubism, you have flesh, experience, you have to some extent uh, the eye in movement, and you bring all of these pieces in a lived visual experience. This is one thing. This is why it's a classical image. On the other hand, when you look at Robrier, things are suspended. They are outside of time. Practically nothing moves. Everything is a pure presence suspended in time. And even when you move, you move as if you are, I don't know, to say on rails. Uh, and of course, you don't have movement, passage of time, perspectives, and the like. So you see the difference is that in uh, Le Cubines, you have really like, I look at the object from different uh, uh, points of view or vantage point in order to reconstitute my living activity of seeing. Because for the cubism, seeing is not like a static, uh, a static uh, activity, like uh, in the uh, you know mono-centered perspective, but it's something which happens in movement. I was taken to this kind of reflection, while for Rabrier, the pure presence is something that you get out of the normal way of seeing and out of the vital way of seeing, meaning the way we see when we are. Uh, uh, in life. So you extract these things. Uh, I'll show you a section, maybe you will get it better. Uh, no worries, yes, uh, you can leave if you want, but I'll show you this clip and then I conclude. I hope you'll see this clip and then I conclude. I hope you'll see. Uh, yeah, so turn on, yeah. So I hope you will uh, see the repetition at least. So this is from La. Uh, so this 
so this is from uh, La Belle Captive. Il y a quelqu'un? Il y a quelqu'un? En dépit de l'inscription Villa Seconde, remarquée déjà cette nuit, j'avais de la peine à reconnaître le curieux hôtel de passe où j'avais dormi avec la problématique fiancée de Corinthe, cette belle inconnue que toutes les polices recherchaient. C'est pas la peine de vous esquinter appuyer sur le bouton. J'ai plus de sonnette depuis longtemps. Peut-être même que la grille ne s'ouvre plus. Mais alors, comment est-ce qu'on entre On n'entre pas. En tout cas, ça doit le faire. Des siècles. C'est passe là deux fois par jour depuis trois ans. J'ai jamais vu cette porte ouverte. Jamais. Mais quelqu'un a dit cela. Non, bien sûr. Qui voulez-vous C'est complètement vide. Les fenêtres battent à tous les vents. Et l'intérieur est tout en ruine, à ce qui paraît. Si c'est pour des renseignements, demandez plutôt aux voisins. Mais je vous préviens, il est un peu bizarre. Allez, salut. Et bonne chance. Demandez plutôt aux voisins, et je vous préviens, il est un peu bizarre. I hope you got the Allez, salut. And the repetition. Bonne chance. Uh, okay, so to, to get that, I think you need to watch some Rob Grier because it's a bit difficult to, to, to describe. And I hope you detect an immortal these fixed angles. And with these fixed angles, this is why maybe your friend thought about uh, uh, cubism. But you see, it's not angles and movements, fixed angles, and you go from one angle to the other. And you have this word which is constituted by these uh, views. So these are the two totalities. And why are they in time? Because as you can see, these totalities cannot be distinguished from the process who builds the totality, which means the totality of memory or of the past. When you remember citizen Kane, the object you build in your memory will be only the memories you're able to remember and nothing else. You see, let's suppose you want to remember your childhood. Your childhood is now limited to the number of memories that you can get, and everything else is lost. So you can build a totality, which is opposed to the totality of the idea, the classical totality. In the classical totality, the totality is independent from you. You discover the world, and you don't build the world while you are discovering it. While in the temporal totalities, meaning in the postmodern totalities, the objects, this world of pure presence, is actually itself constituted by your descriptions, and the memory of something is constituted by your remembrance. And this is how you build these two totalities, which are uh, connected to the process of describing or to the process of remembering. So I hope this is more or less clear. I hope you read the notes. 
If you need more explanation on, on that, I'm uh, available all the time. Uh, and uh, you can listen again to this course or you can listen to the audios. I really advise you to listen to the audios. I think the voice is better and, you know, it's a normal course. You don't have interruptions and all of this uh, mess. So you can listen to that also if you want to get a more concrete idea of what is uh, going on. So do you have questions on that or we call it a day? Is it no, clear? I'm okay. Okay, okay. So see you next uh, Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.